All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our podcast on Pan's Labyrinth. Um, so we're just gonna highlight a few parts of the film that we just wanted to discuss. Um, I just wanted to ask Marie, what did you think about the music of the film? As far as the music of the film, I noticed that, or when I was doing my research on it, I found out that it was, all of the music was written and composed by Javier Navarrete. And to keep with the theme of the film, a lot of the music was dark in tone. Um, it was also noticeable when I was listening to music, I often noticed a like choir type music or orchestra. Um, a lot of orchestral uh, instruments in it. And when I researched it, it was, I found out that he wrote the music for a full orchestra in a large choir. So it was nice to be able to actually hear the elements that he was going for. And for most of the songs, you hear a mix of piano or woodman, woodwind instruments to give that sort of fantasy or mystical effect. It gives the watcher or listener the feel that they are encountering another world. And it was often made clear when the main character, Ophelia, was about to enter or have an encounter with this other world when the music would play the sounds of a song that sounded magical in a sense where you hear that piano or like flute or just often woodwind type instruments. And like in most films, when something bad was about to happen, you would hear more dark or ominous music to reveal to the watcher that they should probably be prepared for the worst. And due to the fact that Navarrete wrote the music specifically for the film, all of the musical elements do well at highlighting the mood or tones of the scene. Thank you, Marie, for those insightful comments. I also would agree. Um, Brianna, what did you think about um, sort of like the actors and the casting in the film as well. So um, this film did have a lot of characters, like a lot of side characters and everything. So I'm just going to focus on the main ones. But um, so Ophelia was played by, I don't know if I'm saying her name right, Ivana Baccaro. And this was actually her first film and you wouldn't even be able to tell because her acting was so good to me personally. Um, she actually won multiple awards for this movie. And like I said, you would, I wouldn't even know that this was her first time acting in a movie. Um, the Pale Man was played by Doug Jones. And this was like her almost imaginary friend, the person that she will always see when she went into this other world. And he often plays roles that are not human and are like some type of creature like he did in this film. Um, Carmen, who was Ophelia's mother, was played by Ariadna Gill. And she's also a Spanish actress who has been in other Spanish films. Um, by, I, I don't know, I'm probably saying these names wrong, but Vital was played by Sergi Lopez. And he was um, Carmen's husband and like the main antagonist of the film. And he was portrayed as pretty selfish to me. And I think that was ultimately his demise when he died at the end. Um, Mercedes, who was played by Maribel Verdu, was the housekeeper. And um, she ended up looking out for Ophelia when her mother got really sick. And yeah. Um, and then the doctor was played by Alex and Gulo. And yeah. So I personally think these characters were casted very well. And I think you can tell that each person took their role seriously and really like tapped into the character. So yeah. Um, so now I just want to ask Bryce, what do you think about the editing and camera work in the film? So um, a common theme throughout the film was the the difference between it was like it was kind of like a, a living a double life like you saw that um philia she was by day she was um this lady's daughter and at night she was secretly some underworld king's daughter and she kind of like lived 
two lives at once. So you can see that very heavily in the in the camera work, as you see, like whenever she's with her mother, it's like pretty, it's like daytime, it's light out, like everything's kind of on that side. And then whenever she's talking to her little fawn friend, she's on, like it's nighttime, it's dark. Like they do very well at kind of dif differentiating between the two, my apologies, differentiating between the two like lives that she's living. Um, you could also see in the, the camera work, as they like, typically as they, they go throughout the film, every character that is speaking, they kind of zoom in on like each character and they kind of like really focus very heavily on whoever is speaking at the moment. And it shows like how you have to kind of pay attention to like the small details within the film to like really understand like what's going on. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, the, the main thing that I noticed about the editing was simply just the fact that like, it seemed like there were just two two sides to every story. You had Ophelia living a double life. You had the, the doctor living a double life. You had the, the maid living a double life. So it was just like a lot of different things happening throughout the film where it was like two sides to this one big story that all kind of meshed together. And yeah. Thank you. Um, Miles, so what did you think about the settings and the costume in the film? Uh, yeah, the settings, the, the setting of the story was <clears throat> was set around 1940s during the Spanish Civil War. And the story, it starts at a military outpost where Olivia and her mother were going to the, uh, stay, and it's some, <clears throat> which is somewhere outside of Madrid in rural Spain. And then as the story went on, of course, she was going to some, uh, she was introduced like to a fantasy world in an ancient stone labyrinth. Uh, and she was going back and forth from, a court, like, this is how um, Raisha said it, a, a military outpost by day, you know, living with her mother and helping her with that, helping with the, um, her pregnancy and stuff, to um, living a whole fantasy life in the labyrinth. And that's where, I voice is where I believe most of her uh, Olivia's like story arc takes place is within the labyrinth, and um, even though both both of those settings were somewhat different, they did come they connected the story uh, at the end, and then the costumes the costumes were like, of course the costumes of the the um what the uh, the soldiers and stuff wore and like what everybody wore outside was fine, but like the, the costumes I guess they had for the um. The creatures and stuff they're pretty abstract they're pretty interesting to look at so and i guess that helps set the uh the tone of the story that like it's not really a your average fairy tale so yeah yeah um just in terms of the setting um the script definitely was centered around the setting um as miles said um the film takes takes place in 1944 in spain which is actually five years after the end of the Spanish Civil War. And the fascist soldiers are led by Captain Vidal, Vidal in a force in order to fight off the rebels. Um, I believe that the script does an excellent job of including the historical aspect of the time, but it also includes the mythical aspect as well when the audience follows Ophelia into these various tasks she has to complete throughout the film. Um, there are also various story plots throughout the film. Um, once again, Ophelia's journey as she completes his task in order to be reunited with her true father. Um, Ophelia's mom, Harmon, her difficult pregnancy. Um, the captain's violent path fighting off the rebels. And lastly, Mercedes and the doctor's scheme in order to help the rebels. I think it could be difficult to understand how these various plots may come together at first. But as um, these turn of events continue to transpire, the various plots become fused together, um, which the screenwriter of the film, um, Gil Mero del Toro, does exceptionally well. And I just would like to end our podcast with focusing and discussing some of the psychological impacts of the film. So I just wanted to go back to Miles. What did you think about? Um, how this film might affect us psychologically. 
Yeah, so one of the things I noticed in the film is uh, when she, when um, <clears throat> that uh, I believe that um, Olivia was going, oh, Ophelia was going to and from the uh, the labyrinth to, you know, kind of get away from the atrocities of the fascist Spain at the time. So, you know, she's using that as her, her escape. And, but at the end of the movie, you kind of can see that she learns to come to terms with like how Spain is through the, um, just through seeing how the story was taking place in the labyrinth. And that's how, um, it could, I mean, that as this, Kind of pointed out as interesting. Like I don't, I don't say specifically is the, uh, uh, like it doesn't really impact us psychologically. I like, like if unless you see it as a deeper meaning. But I just found that interesting. Um, Murray, what did you think about um how the film psychological? What was the overall psychological impact? For me, this film really wasn't what I thought it was going to be, especially in terms of the fact that for most fantasy-based worlds that involve like fairies and like mystical creatures and whatnot, you usually see like a more light type of vibe, whereas this film was pretty dark. Um, and I feel like that's probably due to the fact that it does take place after a war. So the overall times are just not great, even though like, Miles said Ophelia was trying to escape the um, atrocities and hardships that were going on in her reality um, by escaping to the labyrinth. It still was overall just dark sort of theme or vibe to the film from what I've noticed when watching. Yeah, going off of what um, you're saying, I think there's definitely, um, this theme of good versus evil throughout the film um, and what we define as good versus evil. Because like Miles was saying, um, Ophelia is going to this um, different mythical world in order to escape Spain. However, and thinking that it would be um, more so of this fairy tale life. However, there is still more there's still evil just in a different degree, I guess you want to put it. So I think what really is like this big takeaway from the film is conceptualizing what good versus evil is and kind of seeing that that might be different in each aspect and you can't necessarily get away from what good versus evil is. However, it may be defined differently depending in the different worlds that you live in. Um, just to kind of end there. Is there anything else that anyone wants to add in? All right, so that concludes our podcast for the evening. Thank you for tuning in and listening.